Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. It's my great pleasure and privilege as chairman of the Isacon Gallery Trust to welcome you all here on this very, very special occasion. My name is John Allen, and I've been asked to act as master of ceremonies for the formal proceedings this afternoon and to introduce our distinguished speakers. If you've had a chance to look at the exhibition in the gallery, you'll have seen some of the many amazing stories attached to this remarkable building. Indeed, it's one of these stories that we're here to commemorate. The residency at the Isocon, formerly known as Lawn Road Flats, in the 1930s of Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Laszlo Maholinage. The installation of this plaque is surely a milestone, not only in celebrating these three giants of modernism, but also in giving further recognition to the building that was briefly their home and refuge. The Isocon was opened exactly 84 years ago today, on the 9th of July, 1934, and stood at the cutting edge of modern architecture in Britain, both in terms of its architectural design and also for its radical social ideals. But while there was really nothing to compare with it locally, we can now see how it reached out to Europe and beyond as part of that upsurge of progressive and exploratory thought that for convenience we refer to as the modern movement. For one brief shining moment, the Isocon became its English epicenter, providing a haven for its fabulously cosmopolitan resident community with a warmth and a welcome that surely still offers lessons today in the incalculable value of our relationship with our European neighbors. As a lot of you will know, the Isocon Lawn Road Flats has come through many vicissitudes, starting with the war, of course, when it escaped numerous nearby bombs, but more recently surviving a period of near dereliction before being restored and revitalized under the auspices of Notting Hill Housing Association in a rescue project which it was my privilege to lead when I was a director of Avanti Architects. An integral part of that project was the creation of the gallery behind me here, though this did not come to fruition until 10 years after the completion of the building restoration itself. Yet, since the Isocon Gallery opened in 2014, we've welcomed over 15,000 visitors from around the world who want to learn more about the remarkable story of the Isocon in which these three Bauhauslers play such an important part. And this blue plaque surely underlines the enduring resonance of this story that we're all here to celebrate. So now let me introduce the first of our distinguished speakers, Kate Maver, Chief Executive Officer of English Heritage, the organization responsible for the installation here today. Kate. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here in the company of so many guests and all my fellow speakers uh, to commemorate these three remarkable figures who hold a very special place in the world of architecture and design. And there's no question that this blue plaque um, will, is commemorating these modern design pioneers in a way that's going to be very popular. I can imagine there'll be a lot of people coming out of the tube at Belsize Park and making a beeline so Gropius, Breuer, Moholy Nage, the lived, uh, we've heard, in the Lawn Road Flats uh, in the mid-1930s. And this, we thought, was the only place where all three of them could be commemorated. And it's certainly the most appropriate place. The Blue Plaque Scheme was founded in May 1866, which makes it probably the oldest of its kind. It was founded by the Society of Arts and it passed from the GLC to English Heritage in 1986. And we now have 930 blue plaques on the register throughout Greater London. This is the 936th plaque. And I commend to you the amazing app 
which you'll be able to, which allows you to find the one that's just around the corner from your house and you didn't even know was there. So it really has captured the public imagination. We've got Nobel Prize winners, we've got sporting greats, the stars of ballet, writers, politicians, and of course, architects and bridge builders. Uh, the f there are also figures with connections to this building. So for example, the architect, Wells Coates, has his, Coates has his own uh, blue plaque, which you can find in Knightsbridge. A rather famous resident, one Agatha Christie, also has her own blue plaque in Kensington. And we've also got the, a plaque to some of the people who frequented the ISO bar. Uh, Henry Moore, the sculptor, at Park Hill Road, just around the corner from here. And incidentally, in that very same road, there is a plaque to Pete Mondrian, the painter, happened to live in the same street. So English Heritage is now a charity. We are charged with looking after over 400 amazing historic sites all around the country from Hadrian's Wall in the north through Stonehenge down to the romantic Tintagel in Cornwall. Three quarters of our sites are free for people to visit, uh, but we, we welcomed uh, 6.4 million visitors last year, of whom 300,000 were children on free educational visits. We do a great job of bringing history to life in the place where it actually happened, just as we are doing here with the blue plaques. And we go to great lengths to earn lots of money to support all that. And I hope all of you will be trooping through the Isaacon Gallery shop, where you'll be delighted to find pla plates, mugs, uh, postcards and essential fridge magnets commemorating <laughs> this plaque and the director of the gallery is sporting a unique t-shirt which unfortunately you can't buy in the shop but we're all for earning the money so I've just got a few thank yous to say um, we do do a lot of commercial work to earn our money but of course the whole blue plaque scheme is supported by philanthropy and uh, especially warm welcome to our donors who are here today who generously give to allow us to put these plaques up uh, we also wanted to thank the owners, <coughs> the Notting Hill Genesis, uh, the residents of the, of the house who've, or the flats who've allowed us to put this up, and of course the, the Notting Hill Genesis have sponsored the reception, which has been uh, magnificently organised by Danny Oldroyd. I'd like to thank the Icecon Gallery Trust, who have opened the gallery today. Uh, it's open at weekends normally. Uh, they've supported us in putting up this plaque and planned the whole thing. And there are many others who I would obviously like to mention, but you know, in particular, John Allen and Magnus England, without whose time and knowledge and enthusiasm, this would never have happened. Uh, so thank you all very much. I'm, look, I'm happy to pass you on to the next speaker. Thank you, Kate. Now our next Kate, uh, Kate Davis, who is the owner of this property. Uh, and is indeed the trust's landlord for the gallery uh, and who supported us in our rescue project back in the day. So it's a real joy to have Kate Davis here. Kate. Thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> Hello, everybody. So I work for Notting Hill Genesis and we have 64,000 homes. But these 26 flats are very, very special. They're quite different to what we normally do. And as John said, it was a, a fundamentally different thing when we rescued the building. Uh, to make it into housing for key workers in Camden, teachers, nurses, people who are vital to our London economy but couldn't afford to uh, buy on their own. So it was a shared ownership scheme that we developed and I'm so proud to be associated with this. Lit up at night, this looks like an ocean going liner. Um, it is the jewel in the crown for Notting Hill Genesis. A grade one listed, pink, visionary, experimental building in Hampstead is truly something to write home about if you uh, are running a housing association. And um, in my office, I've got a model of this block of flats. I've also got a big poster uh, from the 1930s when it was first uh, available. And so everybody who comes into my office has to be treated to the story of Isacon. And it's something I look at every single day and feel really proud to be associated with it. The renovation of these flats, despite the costs and limitations which we've long forgotten, and the slightly chilly interiors which I'm sure people still uh, have to put up with, uh, to do this as a modern, radical uh, housing association 
uh, does make us all feel good and proud of, of our efforts. So it's not just a concrete marvel, it was and still remains an affordable housing project for people. And uh, we're acknowledging this today through the amazing blue plaque scheme of English heritage, sponsored by my friend David Pearl, who's with us today, and I'm very pleased to, to see that. Uh, the three people we're commemorating were Jewish, even though two of them became Christians. Um, and they came to London to feel safe. The, uh, the, the cosmopolitan community that John referred to is still with us today. And it was important that they could continue in their towering work as part of the Bauhaus movement and to practice what they preached in the way that they lived in a minimalist, positive and sharing lifestyle, which is sort of coming around again uh, in, in a positive way, I believe. So the, the thinking behind the Bauhaus movement was about equality, democracy, everybody having access to good design, and the very particular way John and his team worked to make sure that the details of this scheme were right, were authentic, but also very beautiful. The door knobs, the cupboard knobs, the, the numbers on each house, they all have their own particular font. And to, as a housing association, to be associated with good design and to make beautiful buildings for ordinary people to live in, this is very, very much part of our vision. We're incredibly proud to have played a part in restoring this grade one listed building to its former beauty and now to see no fewer than three former residents honored with a blue plaque. I think this is the first time three people have shared a plaque and they're all giants. They probably should have had three plaques, but they've got to, to share one, but that is very important. So it was founded uh, on a principle of providing affordable housing for Londoners and a purpose that remains at the heart of our work today. Thank you all very much for your support and for coming today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is Jerry Harrison, former Camden Borough Councillor and a stalwart campaigner for the ISICOM during the period of its greatest vulnerability. Jerry and also colleagues on the local Belsize Conservation Area Committee must take a very large share of the credit for the fact that this building is still here at all. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Jerry Harrison. Jerry. Good afternoon. Uh, I should slightly correct. It's very nice to hear what John has said. But there was a councillor long before me, well, not so very long before me on Camden Council, who was chair of the housing committee called Ken Livingston, uh, who wanted to flatten this place, to put up three tower blocks like that. And fortunately, English Heritage stepped in and spotlisted it, I think, at that time. So he couldn't do that, which is why we're all still here. Um, uh, let me just say, I represented uh, this ward. It was called South End Ward for uh, eight years, from 1995 to, um, 1994 to 2002. And there are other gems, architectural gems in this ward. There's the Samuel Toulon Church just up the hill, St. Stephen's, which is worth a visit. And uh, by contrast, there's the Tramwayman's Shelter, which I've managed to persuade English Heritage to, to shot, uh, spot list just down here. It's now the bus shelter for the number 24 bus drivers. Um, uh, I was, um, I'm, I feel honoured by having these treasures on my patch and I felt it my duty as a councillor to try and save them in whatever little way I could. And um, here was, uh, uh, John has mentioned this, I mean this, this building was extraordinary. Um, it was going downhill fast. Uh, the people that were living here were a mixture of the old Jewish Eastern European fraternity uh, and a lot of young uh, homeless uh, people with, uh, shall we say, social problems. I remember very well two murders in that eight-year period uh, and uh, a suicide, uh, a very bloody suicide. I went into the bathroom where this man had slashed his wrists. He was, a, he was an elderly 80-year-old uh, gentleman from Vienna. And uh, he slashed his wrists because of the, the drugs uh, party that was going on in the next door flat. Uh, I was here on police raids now and again, and there was this extraordinary um, occasion when a man um, on the top floor, high as a kite, jumped off the balcony, bounced on the roof of the uh, garage here, and recovered very quickly. The police started running back down after him, and he jumped to the floor and then ran off down the road. Uh, I don't know whether ever he was caught, but he uh, certainly escaped being caught here 
extraordinary. That's the power of drugs. Uh, I'm not recommending that one takes it. <laughs> but, um, before I stood for election, I had actually heard of the Bauhaus. Uh, I um, nearly studied art uh, in another career, and, uh, and the modern movement. And uh, I was passionate about doing something about this building. I'd even heard of Agatha Christie. Um, and um, more recently, I'd become familiar with the gentlemen and one or two ladies of the KGB who hung about these parts, including Arnold Deutsch, who, as you probably know, um, was responsible for recruiting the Cambridge Five. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, you've heard. You've. You will have heard, heard and, uh, and about the, the building itself and the famous people associated with it. I just want to tell you a little anecdote. Uh, not very far away in South Hill Park, I was walking up the road and I saw a skip outside a house. And at the top of this, in the skip, was a Marcel Breuer long chair. Uh, it was. Um, it was uh, in dilapidated, to say the least. And uh, I knocked on the door, and the house was, I don't know if he's here, Nicholas Wood, the architect. It was his skip, and it had told me it had been a wedding present. It, it, his skip, his chair, it, the chair had been a wedding present, and um, it had suffered over the years since his marriage with kids and whatever. And it was in a sorry state. And so I said to him, can I, can I have it, please? And he said, help yourself. So I came back with my car, and I put this dilapidated uh, long chair on the roof of the car, tied it up with some cord, and took it home. And my wife was horrified, because the only place we could put it was on the sofa. And uh, for about six months, this chair stood on the could No one could touch the sofa or sit on it, because this chair was in the way. Anyway, so I thought, we've got to do something. So I got a story into the Ham and High, and... Uh, seeking ideas for the chair. I didn't actually want to keep it myself. I felt it should go to a museum. And instantly, uh, a wonderful guy called Jim Myatt came back to me. Jane, his partner, is here. And Jane said, you've got to do something about this. Jim Myatt was a, a brilliant furniture restorer and cabinet maker, and by coincidence had gone to the Slade School of Art and made a study of Breuer. And he, 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 he said, this is wonderful. What a challenge. And he said, it's a labor of love. He said, Jerry, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'll ring you when it's ready. And about six months, Jane says it was less. I think it was about six months uh, that um, he got back to me and said, you can collect your chair now. Anyway, I did, and it was splendid. He'd actually researched all the veneers and put it, the whole thing together, and it looked as good as new, perhaps better even. And so he and I carried it into Berghaus, the Hampstead Museum up the road, and it's still there. And um, the, tr the, the, the work that Jim put into that chair shouldn't be unrecognized. I heard later that the V&A um, sent one or two spies to, th to the Hampstead Museum and liked the chair so much they made an offer. Unfortunately, whoever was the curator at the time, before uh, Jean's time, I think, um, said, no, it's ours go away. Uh, they actually didn't know that it'd been, it had been restored, the v &A, and probably still don't know. But anyway, uh, there it is, up the road. It's a memory of this building in, the, in, in central Hampstead. And um, that's, I think, the end of my anecdote. Um, I wanted just to say, um, add one thing. As a councillor, back in about, I think, 1995, I've been trying to find the letter I wrote to English Heritage saying, I think you should put a blue plaque on this building. And I gave a list of about 15 names. And I, I had a reply, uh, which is quite humorous. I, English Heritage sometimes has a, has a sense of humor. And they said, um, thank you very much, Mr. Harrison, for your uh, list of names. You know, we have thought about it now and again. Uh, but we cannot put all 15 on a blue plaque. And I said, well, what about 15 plaques? And, and, and they came back and they said, um, I'm afraid you'll find that it, the building will look somewhat overloaded. I remember the quote, somewhat overloaded. So that was the end of that correspondence. And thank you, English Heritage, for making it happen for at least three of them at this time. By then, and in those days, people like Agatha Christie could have more than one plaque in London. I think the, the rules have changed now. And so uh, a lot of the people whose names I had on that original list are commemorated elsewhere. But thank you very much indeed.
and on to the next. Thank you very much, Jerry. Now, of course, in recognition that one of our three heroes today, Walter Gropis, came from Germany, it's my great pleasure to introduce Charlotte Schwarzer, who is the Head of Culture and Education at the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany. Please, Charlotte. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here to actually participate in the unveiling of an English heritage blue plaque that marks an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary artistic journey from the Bauhaus School in Germany to NW3 London. And it also is quite fitting that it's taking place this year as we commemorate 1938, the Night of the Crystal, uh, uh, Reichskristallnacht, and also the Kindertransport, and to commemorate that putting up this plaque in the 80th anniversary of 1938 also shows how generous Britain was to take in all those refugees that had been driven out by Nazi Germany. Our gathering here today is in a way also the start of the run-up to the centenary of Bauhaus that will be celebrated with partners in numerous countries all over the world next year. Founded in Weimar in 1919, relocated to Dessau in 1925 and closed in Berlin under pressure from the Nazis in 1933, the School of Design only existed for a comparatively short period, but those 14 years of Bauhaus have irrevocably shaped design and art across the world until the present day. The centenary celebrations with a wealth of activities and projects that will take place in Germany and elsewhere next year also promise a bright future for the legacy of Bauhaus invigorated by new visions and variations. The fusion of fine and applied art, architecture and design, dance and theater, this concept Gesamtkunst marked a major turning point for design and its role in society. And going back in time, the Bauhaus School of Design developed against the backdrop of political turmoil after the First World War and came to an end during the rise of National Socialism in Germany. And even though the Bauhaus itself was not political in itself, but its vision of openness and internationalism, the experimentation was bound to clash with the right-wing nationalistic interests of, 19, of the early 1930s. As a consequence, the masterminds behind the Bauhaus School, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Lazlo Maholi Nagy, all had to flee Germany and found a new safe haven here in the UK, like so many other immigrants. And they were, in a sense, for a time very fittingly reunited here in the Lawn Road Flats, with this very much groundbreaking experiment in itself. And through these three artists and designers, the Bauhaus vision of diversity, pluralism, internationalism continued to unfold and has been and still is an overwhelmingly global success story and maybe one of the most sustainable exports of German culture we've had. Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer and Laszlo moholy Nagy have contributed immensely to the world we live in now and through them we celebrate the values that enabled Bauhaus to flourish for such a long time. And please allow me to conclude with my heartfelt thanks to all those who made it possible that these three Bauhaus icons will now be remembered through an English heritage blue plaque. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. Fabulous. And now, similarly, in recognition that our other two heroes, Marcel Breuer and Laszlo Mahali Naj, came from Hungary, it's my great pleasure to introduce Beata Margite Becht, Deputy Head of the Hungarian Mission in London. Uh, and uh, Beata has very kindly stepped in at short notice to take the place of the Hungarian ambassador, who is unable to attend today's event, but sends his apologies and his warmest greetings. Beata. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, after all the distinguished speakers and before the, <laughs> before, uh, the words uh, given by the artists uh, themselves or on behalf of the artists themselves, I think as a representative of Hungary, my most important task here, besides being very short, 
is um, to express our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to all who worked so hard to help this event come true. Uh, all the trustees of director of Isokon Gallery for initiating and lobbying to English Heritage, to Nothing Hill Housing Trust and Camden Council, of course. It is thanks to their efforts that two Bauhaus icons, Laszlo Moholy Nagy, congratulations for everyone who could pronounce that so far, and uh, Marta Breyer joined the list of uh, eminent Hungarians that have already been marked uh, by Boo Plax in London, like our famous politician Lajos Kossuth, composer Béla Bartók, or Nobel Prize winner Dénes Gábor. You can't help bumping into Hungarians every corner. Mohali Nagy was a sort of renaissance man, uh, a polymath of almost, almost compulsive character who created kinetic sculpture, experimental film, light projections, set designs for opera, even ads to London Underground. But if you didn't happen to know that Bauhaus designers can actually save the world with the help of ecological engineering of nature, then please one of, uh, watch one of the greatest science fictions ever made, Things to Come, uh, which was written in 1936 by A.G. Wells, promoted by film producer Sir Alexander Korda, another famous Hungarian already commemorated with a blue pack, and for which Moholy Nagy contributed several set designs. Marta Breyer too was a pioneering modernist designer. On arrival in London, when he already made his name big with his uh, metal Vasily chair, he was apparently um, asked to design furniture for Isokon, but gently warned by the owner, Jack Pritchard, that the British, uh, British might be a bit too traditional to enjoy uh, metal furniture, and he better go for plywood. So it is maybe may partly due to the British conservative mindset that another trademark piece of modern design furniture, the Isokon long chair, was born. Uh, today the work and international success of these Hungarian talents inspire creatives around the world. Many of them are studying in Budapest at Moholina University of Art and Design. Therefore, allow me once again to thank everyone who advanced the cause of commemorating them with a blue plaque. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, our speaker lineup would obviously not be complete without a representative of the Pritchard family. They started it all, after all. So please step forward, John Pritchard, grandson of Jack Pritchard, the original client who will also speak on behalf of Moholy Nagy's family. John. So, this is uh, a letter from Hatula Moholy Nagy, uh, Recollections of Jack Pritchard, and it's dated the 1st of March of this year. I have only a few fuzzy memories of our family's sojourn in London. However, I do recall that both of my parents greatly valued their friendship with Jack and Molly Pritchard. By providing social and material support, the Pritchards eased the immigration transition of my parents and several of the Bauhaus circle. My parents kept in touch after we left England and moved to the United States. When I was still young, we had an Isocon long chair in our living room in Chicago. It was quite comfortable. <laughs> But what I liked most about it was that it was so lightweight that it was possible to bounce it around the room while seated. <laughs> I suspect that this fun but thoughtless activity did not extend its lifespan. I have good personal memories of Jack from two widely separate occasions. The first is of a trip Jack made to Chicago in the 1940s. This was remarkable in view of the fact that World War II had cut off most civilian travel between Europe and the United States. One afternoon, he took me, my sister Claudia, and Jennifer and Jacques A. Thwaites to the Lincoln Park Zoo. More than 30 years later, in 1978, Jack hospitably invited me, my husband, and our two children 
for an overnight stay in his house at Blytheburgh. Although almost 80 years old at that time, he was most entertaining. I remember he told us that he swam every day in the pool in his garden. At this time, when migration has become such a global concern, it is especially fitting that the Isacon Gallery, Lawn Road Flats, and Jack and Molly Pritchard should be recognized with an English Heritage blue plaque. The social vision of the Pritchards truly deserves to be acknowledged. If I may add, I think Jack and Molly would have been so thrilled by the work the Notting Hill and Avanti architects have done here with the Isacon Gallery created by Magnus and John. And I think they would have been absolutely delighted to see these three modernist giants honoured today with the blue plaque. Thank you. And finally, Wolf Burkhardt, who is the great nephew of Walter Gropius, will speak on behalf of the Gropius family. And then after he's finished, I'm going to invite him to unveil the plaque. Wolf. Right. Um, thank you. Um, I promised to be very, very brief and not to try and repeat what others have said um, before. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot begin to tell you what an extraordinary honour it is for me to have been asked to be here today and to unveil a plaque dedicated to Marcel Breuer, Laszlo Moholy-Nauch and my great uncle Walter Gropius, three central figures of the modernist movement who found refuge here in Hampstead as the Nazis took against the Bauhaus. Sadly, um, as you can imagine, I never met uh, Onkel Walter as he died long before I was born but my father and his siblings have very fond memories of him. My grandfather, Georg Joachim, and Onkel Walter were very close, and I think the separation after Walter emigrated first to Britain and then to America must have rather pained them. At home, we have several photographs um, uh, from the early 1900s, some of which show Walter, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather all dressed up in Oriental costume for a party at their holiday retreat in Timdorf. And these images, to me, are very evocative of the somewhat bohemian pre-World War I lifestyle that Walter introduced to the rather formal and somewhat stuffy atmosphere of his parents' home. In 1952, my then 18-year-old aunt and godmother, Almud, who's now 84, and I know that she wouldn't mind my saying that, uh, giving her name, uh, her age, um, was sent to the United States um, to stay with Walter and Ease in Lincoln uh, near Cambridge in Massachusetts. To get there, she embarked on a very long boat journey, which first brought her to New York, where she stayed with one of Walter's architectural assistants, a young American of Chinese descent, now 101, who later gained fame by placing a pyramid in front of the Louvre. Last year, I first visited my aunt and uncle's house in Lincoln, together with the curators um, of Historic New England. I had just spoken over the phone with my um, two aunts who had stayed in the house in the 50s and 60s and uh, 50s and 70s respectively and I was most touched to be shown the guest book with the photographs of my aunts as well as my beloved late grandmother Louise who I remember so well uh, telling me about Lincoln and having to drive Isa to the airport in this huge American car terribly worried whether she would ever make it back to the house. Everyone in the family who knew him was very, very fond of Walter, and my father always stresses what a good listener he was, a man with a soothing, deep voice who always had an open ear for the young. And in this case, the young were my father's generation, born during or just before the Second World War, so their future prospects at the time certainly must have appeared rather gloomy. It was thanks to the Pritchards family um, that Walter and Isa found a new temporary home here in Britain before moving to the United States, where he became professor for architecture at Harvard and where he and Isa remained for the rest of their lives. Walter and Isa were incredibly lucky to have been greeted here at the Isacon building by the Pritchard family with very open arms indeed. Breuer, moholy and Walter were forced to leave Germany because of the new regime that had taken over, a terrible regime led by the fear of the other and the fear of the unknown. 
There is no question that all three, Marcel, Laszlo and Walter, having seen the atrocities to which fascism and populism has led over the course of the 20th century, would be utterly horrified by some of the political developments that we are all witnessing today in large parts of the Western world. Roya, Moholy Nach, and Gorpios were immigrants. Some may say refugees. It is therefore most commendable that, just as international migration has become the most prominent political issue dominating continental Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States, English heritage has decided to bestow upon the Isacon building the honor of a blue plaque. A blue plaque for three immigrants who left their mark on the cultural landscape of this country. Having been a foreigner myself for most of my life, for 20 years in France and now 10 years in Britain, it is very humbling to have been asked to unveil this blue plaque for three immigrants, three foreigners whose move from one country to another was infinitely more difficult than my own. Thank you. Right, um, I haven't really done this before, as you can imagine. So I'm told to just... Here, so and stand oh. clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bravo. Uh, Bravo, well done, thank you. I've got just one more short duty, uh, which is to thank everyone who's played a part in making today's event happen. English Heritage, obviously, for commissioning and installing the plaque, especially Cathy Power and Emma Goff, also Howard Spencer for his crucial early support, Notting Hill Genesis for their generosity in providing the refreshments, especially Daniel Aldroyd, Avanti Architects for providing professional waiter services, uh, and my fellow gallery trustees, Magnus England, director, <coughs> Fiona Lamb, treasurer. Uh, <laughs> and I also want to mention Tom DeGay, our indefatigable graphic designer. I know he's here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah.